Hi everybody and thank you for joining us today for our uh, live webinar, Optimizing Your Maintenance Turnaround. My name is Kim Melton and I will be the moderator for today's presentation. presentation excuse me. Joining me are David Patrick from Apache Industrial Services and Jack Bittner from Johns Manville. Um, before we dive into introductions, I do want to go over a few logistics. First, we're going to conclude the webinar with a live Q&A session. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, you can submit them via the Q&A box on the right side of your screen. If you don't see that Q&A box, if you look in the top right corner, there should be a, a Q&A up there. And if you click on that, it'll open a dialog box that you can use to submit your questions. Now, we're frequently asked whether or not we send out these presentations upon their conclusion. And while we don't send out the presentation itself, we do post a recording of it online for you to watch at your leisure or even share with your colleagues. And, and this ensures that you can actually have the presentation within its full context. Now, this is also part of how we deliver the JM experience to you. So at Johns Manville, the JM experience is it's part of our culture and is based on four pillars, people, passion, perform, and protect. And we offer webinars like this um, to help educate the market and offer a tool and a resource for you and your business. And we're continuously striving to improve and evolve these webinars. So if you have any comments or suggestions as to how we can better accomplish this, or maybe you even feel like we missed the mark today, we'd encourage you to fill out the survey um, that you're going to receive at the end of the webinar. And we actually use your feedback to improve these and make sure we're providing the information that has the most value to you. So on that note, let's get to introductions. We're going to kick things off here with David. If you could take a few minutes to introduce yourself. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is David Patrick. I'm an installation operations manager. I'm based out of Westlake, Louisiana. I've been with Apache Industrial Services about three and a half years, and I've got very close to 40 plus years in the industry. Uh, Apache is an industrial specialty contractor. We serve our customers with trained technicians and coatings, both shop and field, insulation, refractory and fireproofing, and scaffolding access. Uh, predominantly, we do work in the Gulf Coast regions, but have done work all over the United States. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. And I'm Jack Bittner. I'm the Senior Product Manager at Johns Manville. Um, I've been with JM for 16 years, but I've been in the industrial insulation business for 40 years. And um, I'm the product manager for all of Johns Manville's industrial insulation materials. Johns Manville's in um, a lot of different markets. Um, roofing and um, also HVAC and mechanical insulations, um, but I am uh, my, my life is the industrial insulation business for Johns Manville. And we're here today to talk about uh, maintenance turnarounds, and I'm going to address um, uh, the issues, the, the turnarounds from a manufacturer's perspective, and David's going to talk in a little bit about uh, um, the interest from the contractor's perspective. <clears throat> I'm going to start with um, what I believe we know as a manufacturer about turnarounds. I know the manufacturer is typically farther removed from the, the insulation manufacturer from turnarounds. You're running a facility um, and, and it's your turnaround, you don't all, often see the manufacturers. But um, we play a key part because we've got to get the material to, to you when you need it. So what we know is your turnarounds are relatively infrequent by design. You, you have them every three to five years, and you'd like to extend them even further than that if you could. They're critical for your facility, and you typically schedule them for the off-season, um, which is quite often spring and fall. And we also know that the magnitude of what you accomplish during your turnarounds is immense. I've always likened it to almost like a war effort with what you've got to uh, coordinate between the trades and the crafts and the equipment folks and everything that has to happen in a uh, short amount of time. And you take months planning this and um, you've got um, you know a limited amount of time locked in, whether it's three weeks or four weeks or two weeks or whatever it is, and you don't have a whole lot of flexibility in um, extending that. In fact, you'd like to shorten it if you can. What we also know is insulation is often your last concern. It's certainly the last thing that's um, installed on, a, on the pipes during your turnaround. It's the last thing that's often accomplished. We also know that no plans are set in stone. Um, you plan things, but you, you also find things once the turnaround begins that you didn't and couldn't plan for um, that you find out once you start removing the uh, insulation from the pipes and actually getting into what uh, the conditions are in the unit. And we also know that there's not a whole lot of wiggle room to, to correct for any mistakes that were made or have been made um, during the turnaround. 
So when something happens, it's got to be fixed, it's got to be fixed fast. Time is of the essence. And when you tell us you have to have your material on a specific date during a turnaround, there's really no flexibility. And we also know that your facility is not the only one doing turnarounds in the spring and the fall. Many of our customers are doing the same thing. And we don't want to be the one causing any delays on your part with your turnaround in particular. So we'd like to be a part of planning and executing your turnaround. And the closer we can be to um, what you've got going on, the better we can perform. We know as a manufacturer there's all kinds of potential pitfalls that can befall any job or any project um, during the course of it and leading up to it. You've got deadlines you've got to meet. There's issues with material availability, whether it's from um, you know, the production point of view and inventories or transportation. You've got sequencing, delivering materials when you need it. You might need certain pipe sizes of insulation in the beginning and some in the middle and some in the end, but you don't have room on the job site to store all of it at once. So you've got to sequence the deliveries. You've got to time the deliveries with when the equipment arrives and once it's installed and when the pipes have been pressure tested. You've got to coordinate it with other crafts, like the scaffold guys and the insulators and the pipe fitters. And then there's always what you find out on the job once you get into it that you really didn't know about when you were planning it, and you can't know about everything, and we know that happens every single time. So how do we avoid these pitfalls? Proper planning prevents poor performance, and um, we know the pitfalls are going to happen, but the more we can plan in advance and be involved as a manufacturer in, in advance of the turnaround, the smoother things can run for, for all of us. We know that um, there's a lot of major players that are included in your planning process. You've got your plant crews, your engineers, your contractors, your owners, and we'd like to be a part of that circle as a manufacturer in the planning process. Not in every planning meeting by any means at all, but certainly towards the end so that we can plan our production and our, uh, our, our materials to coincide with what you need when. So how do you get the most from your manufacturer? A few things I'd like you to know about us. Our inventory plans vary seasonally. And as you can see from this chart, our inventory plans kind of vary with your facility's turnarounds. You have them in the spring and the fall, and our inventories go up and down in the spring and the fall. And they're based on historical sales and the um, sales forecast we get from the field from our sales guys who are getting it from um, your contractors and your distributors. We also plan our inventories down to the SKU level, and that's the individual pipe size and insulation thickness. Um, and we inventory or can manufacture um, in any um, uh, insulation material, whether it's calcium silicate or perlite or mineral wool, as much as uh, in excess of 300 SKUs for each of those product lines. But you also need to know we can't turn on a dime. Changing tooling in our production equipment to produce a different pipe size or thickness can take up to four hours. And that's just changing the tooling, the production of um, the different materials from the different product families, cal calcium silicate or perlite or mineral wool, um, takes a, a varying amount of time with those materials itself, sometimes up to several days. And our production schedule, we have a little margin for error, too. And as you might imagine, in any factory or production um, world, unplanned changes in the schedule also has a ripple effect on other orders. We'd always, anybody in a manufacturing world would like to run smoothly without um, uh, unscheduled changeover. We're the same way. And a lot of our inventories are driven by how long it takes to produce a, different, a certain type of materials. Different materials have different production processes and, um, you know, for example, calcium silicate takes a bit longer to make than mineral wool or perlite, so we carry a lot more inventory of calcium silicate than we do those other products because we can't turn that quickly. And down the line, our uh, customers, our distributors, carry a lot more inventory of certain product lines like calcium silicate for the same reasons. So <clears throat> what keeps us up at night as a manufacturer? This is, and it's the questions we're always asking for. 
what's the schedule and what's the bill of materials? And that's where we'd like to get involved in these turnaround planning meetings towards the end, of, you know, at least one or two of them, so we can adjust our schedule and um, to get a bill of materials so we can have something to manufacture against or at least plan around. We know it's going to change. We know your schedule's got to be flexible, and we know the bill of materials that we see at the beginning of a turnaround probably isn't going to be the same one that actually happens, but I got to tell you, um, your guess of what you're going to need is way better than what I'm going to guess or any one of us because you're much closer to it than we are. Um, so anything we can get ahead of time to where we can begin our manufacture of certainly the products that, we, that aren't standard, that aren't typically stocked, um, that you have a pretty good idea you're going to need, any of this helps us as well as the schedule. Anything I think you're going to need first is probably not what you're going to need first. You know that better than I do. Those are the kinds of things that um, will help us sleep better at night and will also help us serve your job um, and your turnaround in a uh, more expeditious manner. So, as I mentioned, any way we can get involved as a manufacturer in, in a pre-turnaround meeting as the turnaround gets closer is going to benefit all of us. And I think I've mentioned some of this already, uh, but the better and the earlier we understand your needs, the more adaptable we can be. We can help with material selection, pre-production planning, and also the timing and delivery of materials um, with your scaffold erection, the removal, and also the timing of the crafts um, moving around your job sites. For seeing supply issues, honestly, guys, this is what keeps us up at night as manufacturers. It allows us to consider alternatives or to adjust production and to even offer alternatives if, um, if there's, there's something that just can't work based on uh, your needs and your timing. It also helps us reduce costs associated with last-minute reactions, um, costs associated with um, reactions in the plant, and also with transportation, which is getting more difficult these days. Transportation, I don't know whether you, well, you probably all know it because this has been happening in our world since really the first, almost the first of the year. Transportation industry in the United States is experiencing major inflation due to lack of drivers and uh, now these uh, legally enforced and limits on drivable hours where the, uh, the logs are no longer handwritten logs, everything's electronic. And securing last minute transportation for all of us is, as manufacturers has become substantially more expensive this year and more difficult to, to secure. So any heads up, any lead times, anything we can know in advance is uh, helpful to all of us. And related to transportation, there's also ways we can help or maximize your transportation, um, the, the, what we can get in the truck. Planning and staging deliveries to minimize job site stores is another thing we can help with. And maximizing material we can get in a truck, as I just mentioned, um, by offering or um, producing materials that uh, just cube out trucks better. There are space-saving materials that, uh, as you can see in the middle, a V-groove mineral wool that ships flat and is formed on a job site. You can get about twice as much as material in general in a truck um, with product like this that ships flat than you can something that's preformed um, and uh, now, now you're shipping air. There are also materials that are hydrophobic, which are um, more job site friendly as far as storage goes um, out you know, in the weather where you don't, aren't able to cover up materials um, or, or put them into a building. And there's water resistance materials um, like the water resistant calcium silicate, which was introduced last year, that uh, is a new product, an extension of a product that's been around for uh, 40 years that uh, gives advantage on the job site as far as uh, installation and um, uh, storage with uh, the, the frequent afternoon rainstorms. And this leads me into um, material selection, insulation materials. Quite often on turnarounds, it's like with like. And there's good reasons for that, because if you change materials um, on a line where you're um, just uh, replacing a, a small amount of it rather than the, than the entire insulation, to change the material, you might end up with a different thickness um, than, than the original product. But these days, it's, it might be worth looking at, because maybe the insulation you had on there hasn't been performing as well. 
um, or are you replacing it because of corrosion under insulation? There are better products these days that help inhibit corrosion that might be something worth looking at um, for, for instead of putting like with like on, put on one that um, helps inhibit or even has a corrosion inhibitor in it. Maybe what you're replacing um, wasn't due to corrosion, but it was just a product that uh, you ended up replacing at the last turnaround too. Um, and it didn't have the compressive strength or the, uh, the ability to withstand the rigors of the application. It just got too beat up over the last three to five years. Or possibly there's a new technology that's around now that wasn't back when you installed that product that might be even better suited to the application. One example of new technology, as I mentioned a couple slides ago, is calcium silicate now is available with a uh, water-resistant feature. It's not hydrophobic like some of the other insulations like perlite or some of the thin blankets, but it is water-resistant um, to uh, what this does is maximize the uh, benefit of mainly for the contractor on the job site when he's installing it and uh, a rainstorm comes up. The job doesn't necessarily have to stop for everybody to uh, cover up the material that wasn't already jacketed. Um, uh, with visqueen waiting for the rainstorm to stop. Work can go on and uh, the, the jacket can be still installed by the end of the day, but you don't have the mad scramble climbing down off the scaffold to find the visqueen to cover it up um, just due to this simple rainstorm. And also the performance. You know, some materials have uh, organic binders which oxidize beginning at 450 uh, Fahrenheit and um, they generally don't, if they're fibrous, don't have the compressive strength. And if they're in a tight spot um, where people are going to be walking on them or leaning ladders up against them or just generally uh, abusing them, um, you might consider replacing it rather with a uh, higher compressive strength product rather than a like with like to where you're going to be replacing it every single turnaround and maybe even between the turnarounds because the, uh, the product's now going to be getting water inside it and just not performing like it's supposed to be. So we can help in the beginning before the turnaround even starts as a manufacturer if, um, if we can get involved a little bit earlier in the process. And David, I'm going to hand the football off to you. Okay, thank you, Jack. So we're in the perfecting the plan stage now. There are three stages usually to all turnarounds. There's a pre-turnaround stage, a actual during the turnaround and a post turnaround stage. These are these are made definite stages because there's things that have to happen in each one. Uh, go ahead, Jack. Sorry. Uh, you got to pick your players to have involved in those things. So the owner is probably the major player. He's the quarterback, right? So he's going to pick an EPC a mechanical contractor, an insulation contractor. He's going to work with material manufacturers and their distributors, and there's probably going to be a non-metal specialist involved in there from the plant, the owner's representative, that will probably track through specifications, application procedures, make those decisions that uh, like and like or to change out things. So those, those all revolve around that maintenance turnaround and they're all part of that making that success in that original plan. So the delegation, the turnaround delegation, the planning goes through several stages. They coordinate with the owner, the EPC, he coordinates with the owner to establish what scope of work that owner wants to get done in that time period. That happens because you have, you've got to have some plan to get finished because time is money here. As Jack said, these could be two-week turnarounds, they could be a week turnaround, they'd be a month turnaround, but they got to, they plan them very closely because the other end of that turnaround, they don't want to be shut down any longer than they have to be because they're producing products that pr produces money for that owner. So they manage the project plan and players, the contractors are involved, the plant personnel are involved, the engineers are involved. Then you have to execute that turnaround plan and that's all part of the EPC's management process. Turnaround planning delegation for the contractor's part of you is you've got to feel verify the needs for the insulation, removal, and tie-in locations. Most of the time, all turnarounds are placing some sort of 
piping sections, maybe not the whole pipe, could be from flange to flange, may just be a valve within the system. So you need to consider up front, is there a need for any kind of asbestos or lead abatement? That needs to be in the plan and done as early as possible because that's something you have to rope off and then everybody knows you have to contain that to get that done. So you have to verify the priorities in each stage of the turnaround. So during this turnaround planning design, the contractor is going to be looking for a list from the EPC that says, this is what's going to be done first, I'll need you to remove this first. That has to work through every part of the turnaround, both for mechanical and insulation parts. So you develop estimates with the client uh, because he's giving you the criteria about turnaround item, test package number, the area location, et cetera. So all those can be done together to see what the total budget would be for that turnaround. You also have to have a contingency plan because of historical discoverables. So there, you have to put in some contingency money in case, you know, this time we go into the reactor and uh, the bottom head is bad and we're going to have to replace it or either repair it because it's happened at every turnaround in history. So it's very possible it's going to turn, happen again. So you have to be prepared to have that ready if it happens again. So the facility owner's portion of the planning is he initiates that process, he establishes what needs to happen during that turnaround, and he has those priorities. Because if he if it gets to a certain point that he runs into so many discoverables, there may be sections of that turnaround they just don't get to because they need to get back online. He has to establish that priority and those needs. He recruits the EPC for support and management of the turnaround. Uh, he determines the budget based on what the EPC returns back to him from all the contractors. And he also represents his or her interest in the turnaround. So. He's always involved. He's always the guy going to get the reports, find out where he stands because he's, time is money in his, in his pocket. Uh, the manufacturer. So I, I'm going to kind of put manufacturer distributors together uh, and, and fabricators because they're the material supply group. They make sure the materials are ready when we need them as a contractor. So they offer information for updated materials, new innovative ideas, and new technology that needs to be kind of brought to the front of the planning that may also stop some of the issues that they've had in the past. They may, as Jack mentioned, it may help reduce CUI problems if there's an issue with that there, or if you discover that during the stripping of the insulation. It also will help them better efficiency down the road so that they save more money with their insulation system by using some of the new ideas and new technology. They have material available information. They know where their, their inventory stand. They know where they'll be during the time of the turnaround. They can confirm priority items, especially those that are maybe odd sizes that have to have special fabrication. They can make sure that happens. They offer staging input to help efficiency. Uh, but certain distributors will be able to package those uh, those items, those individual test items or the individual turnaround items by a package so it's neat and concise and everything you need for that one item so it's easily stored in the field. Uh, they set up quick call, on-call procedures for quick response to, to handle anything that jumps up that we weren't prepared for. The plant personnel certainly going to have a turnaround manager and planners that are part of the owner's plant. Uh, engineers, project managers, construction managers, and non-metallic specialists all are involved in that, that team. Each one of them has a duty to do and you will, you will interact with them as a contractor daily, uh, updating where you're at with any problems or what's going right. So you'll have that interaction all the time during the turnaround. You, you, they, so we will they coordinate with the counterparts at the EPC, they, and the EPC passes that on up to the turnaround manager. Represent the interest of the plant. That's one of the, the biggest things. So they're making sure you're following the plant specifications, watching to make sure things are done safely, and watching to make sure it's the, your housekeeping is good so there's no safety issues with that, and that your materials 
match what's out there, and they're getting what they're paying for, more or less. They also select the materials. So up front in the planning, this is a great time for them to learn from the manufacturers and your contractor, you as a in, maybe in-house contractor or a bidding contractor, to give new information about new materials. As you did the walkthrough, you may find additional uh, things that may need to be taken care of out there they didn't see, and you need to report that back. They also manage turnaround logistic changes. So there's always that involvement with that full team from the owner and the plant personnel. Well, planning for contingencies and surprises, that's, that's easily said, uh, sometimes a lot harder to do. But you have to have some kind of backup plan. So if uh, contractors must plan for to be adaptable, able to move on if certain components are delayed. So if item one, two, and three that you plan to start today are not available yet because mechanical hasn't started or finished their portion of that plan, then you have to have something to move on to be more efficient with your manpower, your material movement, et cetera. So you've got to have the materials lined up and ready to go for multiple tasks. Uh, scaffold builders will have to be coordinated to, to, for multiple priorities as well. So you can't just go have three of them built and you can't work on two of those items and now you're having to wait for uh, scaffolding to be done. But some of that scaffolding needs to be planned around how mechanical, and insulation or and or painting can use it as well so that you're only building one scaffold for everybody's multi-craft purposes. So extra material, you may need to figure five to seven percent extra material for contingencies because like I said you may run into a line that once you start stripping that line for them to either cut, cut out or replace a flange or put in a T or whatever, you find out that material has been damaged, has been walked on or something, and it's all crumbling off, you can't help it, you may need that extra material to finish that out. So as I mentioned earlier, there's three stages to a turnaround. There's pre-turnaround, turnaround, and post-turnaround. So during the pre-turnaround stage, you remove insulation from the tie points, and, and they will allow this sometime if you put uh, a, some temporary insulation until the shutdown occurs. So that keeps you know the heat in in that area, also keeps it from personnel being burned. You can determine the bill of materials from pre-planning data, pre, during, and post turnaround item list. So you have a complete takeoff of the things you need, all the materials you'll need for each tie point or each turnaround item. So you pre-order those materials packaged per those numbers so you know where to stage them so that you can protect the materials efficiently you can have good access to them quickly. Uh, and remember, we're not working on just the flange. Now we insulators work on every foot of pipe because we're touching every foot of it a couple of times depending on the specification, but at least twice for insulation and then the metal. So determine scaffold access requirements. Coordinate this with other crafts to use the same scaffold access. I mentioned this earlier, That's that's a big, money saver and a time saver when you're in a turnaround. If your pre-turnaround scaffold is built for access for all crafts for that item in the turnaround, you save money with and time so that you don't have to rebuild or adjust for each craft. Uh, you also need to keep in mind you need to keep clearance for installation thickness as an application. That happens a lot of times a customer will be wanting to go more efficiently on a line, let's say that he uh, takes out a whole spool piece and he'd like to go back with some thicker insulation because it was very old and didn't, it was calculated on old old systems standards and old uh, feedstock cost. So in that situation, he might want to increase the thickness of that insulation. Be sure there's clearance for that when you go through your pre-turnaround mode and planning mode because that looks Act one is slow you down, and two, if you have to cope out insulation, it just leaves you another spot for ingress of water, uh, which will cause problems later. The learning from your mistakes is the key to ensuring that your turnaround plan is solid. So most of the units that are turned around, unless it's a, coming from a grassroots plant first turnaround, and even so, in that situation, you can check your previous problem areas from other plants or from your plant the last time you did it. Consider the known setbacks so that you can be prepared for those. 
uh, have planning in place to jump those in case they happen, like we talked about earlier on a reactor head or whatever the equipment or piping may be, and plan accordingly. So during the turnaround, you don't have time to plan anymore, okay? Uh, this, this, in the pre-turnaround, you can adjust your planning for the actual turnaround. As you, you may discover things in the pre-turnaround that you didn't find in your planning stage, so you had time to adjust it. But here in the turnaround, it's time to execute. Uh, not a lot of adjustments can be made here without costing the contractor and the owner money and time involved in the turnaround length. So live coordination with other crafts must occur. You have to be, communication is the key. I mean, that's a cliche you hear all the time, but it certainly applies in a turnaround. Up, update the plan daily to incorporate any changes that have happened, reschedule items, reschedule material, uh, line up and where you stage it. All the things that have to happen very quickly to keep on schedule during the turnaround. Post turnaround. So final inspection of insulation on items not designated as operational priority for startup. What that means is there's a lot of times a customer or owner will have a, have a problem with mechanical. He's running two days, three days late on his turnaround for mechanical. Who's he going to look at? He's going to look at the insulation contractor. And what can we do to help him get back online quicker? So some of the things we do is temporary wrap hot valves and flanges with a quick wrap of some insulation to keep people from getting burned, but we'll get him back online. Some cases, where you have metal weatherproofing can be left off because you used hydrophobic insulations, and it can come. You can come back after startup and put on the metal application. You can also sometimes get asked to leave the wells out up front so that you you're plugging those back in after they have finally finished. They do that because they know they're behind in the mechanical situation. I don't like to do that. That material usually gets damaged, causes more labor to put it back in those little sections than, than you think it does. Uh, so hopefully they avoid doing that, but it does come up. Removal of all unused items and return to warehouse. So during this post turnaround sign, you're still going to have some cleanup to do uh, because you're, you may not have all your metal on yet, so you're going to have some of that material out there, so you need to get that back cleared out of the unit. Uh, you do a final performance review and update. And I'm, when I say that, the contractor usually will do that to see what his best practices were during the turnaround, what worked well, what didn't. But that needs to be carried on up to the client and whatever uh, hierarchy goes through that. You can go through the EPC or directly to the owner. But I can tell you, you have to keep those reviews so that it cuts that time down next time. And, it, and you learn something from them. Uh, I've never seen a client refuse that. So de debrief, same thing. What went well? What worked? What didn't work? Did you come across anything new or unexpected? Uh, I may be repeating myself, but all these are very, very important. How can you improve the process? This is something as a contractor you want to know, as a manufacturer, as a distributor, as an owner. For sure, because if it went well and we cut two days off his turnaround period, the money he's saved by producing product quicker, well, money gets attention, right? So they'll listen to this, they'll put in that plan for next time. All right, David, thank you. So with that, I'm going to talk a little bit about some additional resources that we have available um, that can help you as you're specifying insulation or even looking for more information. Um, now, what we've actually created at Johns Manville is a portal called The Source, and this is where we host all of our um, technical documentation, webinars, everything like that, things that we have available to help you as you're trying to educate yourself about the, the industry or maybe a specific product or a specific topic like corrosion under insulation or vibration, et cetera. Um, so with that, in, in the source, we actually have a tool that's very helpful as you're trying to determine your insulation thickness. And how this tool works is um, we've, we've partnered with NEMA, who has the 3E Plus tool, to add specific specifications for John's Manville insulation. 
And what I mean by that is as you plug in your application specifications, the output of this will determine the thickness of John's Manville insulation you need for your job. And so if you know you want to use, let's say, thermal 1200 calcium silicate, you can come on, you can download 3E+, it's free, and this will help you establish how much insulation you actually need for your application. So as I said, on the source, we also host our webinars. This is, this is everything from um, a product webinar, if you're looking for a, basically a broad spectrum overview of what John Fanville offers, all the way down to um, the latest CUI research and what findings are doing in terms of long-term testing. So there's a lot of really rich, valuable content on here. This is where we will post our latest webinar, this one that we're recording right now. And uh, you'll be able to come on here about sometime next week and have this, um, check out this webinar again if you'd like to watch it a second time. We also have access to our blog here. Now our blog contains content that we have our in-house technical team write, and we also actually source information throughout the industry. And so we want to make sure this is rich and robust. It's not supposed to be a product promotional webinar. It's actually supposed to keep you up to date on the latest news and topics and trends in the industry. Now we also have all of our technical documentation here. There's a lot of information here for you if you're looking for guide specifications, installation manuals, um, technical bulletins, that sort of thing. There's a lot of really rich content in here. And then finally, we have our tools section. And this is where you'll find the name of 3E Plus tool. And we also have the Smart Binder here. This is a really convenient app you can put on your phone for fast, easy access and even offline access to data sheets, SDSs, other technical documentation. If you need a presentation, let's say you've got a group of guys on site that are looking for um, maybe learn how to install a material or they need, um, they need detailed information about some certain aspect in the industry, you can actually request a technical presentation. We'll send one of our guys out and um, be happy to talk to you about that. So with that, we will um, we'll get into our certificate of completion here. So everybody who attended today will get a certificate of completion, and that's going to be sent to you by Friday. And um, with that, let's go ahead and open it up to questions. We've had quite a few good ones come through. And our first one is for you, Jack, and that is, um, are there time limits on when an insulation needs to be replaced? That is going to depend on a lot of different things. Um, depends on the insulation. It depends on the environment that it was um, living in uh, for its life up till now. It's, uh, I really can't say five years is it or two years. It depends on where it is, how it was maintained, and um, how much abuse it might have received over its life, so there really isn't one, there isn't, there isn't a, a number I can give on that. Can you elaborate a little on um, which materials need to be checked more often than others? Um, yeah, I mean some materials that were damaged due to um, physical abuse where you've got uh, punctures in the uh, weatherproofing jacket. Um, where maybe they've been walked on and they weren't a high compressive strength material. So like that one picture I showed where the jacket was all beat up, that was a, uh, a, a fibrous material, mineral wool is what it actually was, where it has low compressive strength. So when the jacket gets damaged, now you've got water ingress. And um, certainly whenever you see something like that, um, you want to look very closely there. Uh, principally for uh, water, um, when you get water, you have uh, um, possibility of corrosion under insulation. So um, anything that wasn't maintained well, where you've looked like you've got water, the possibility, well, CUI is a big thing, man. Um, the last uh, 10 years, CUI has become a, a huge concern in the uh, uh, refining and petrochemical and power industries, and uh, that's really the biggest thing people are looking for nowadays. I've heard um, in talking to end users, um, the, the maintenance budgets, and a lot of those are spent during turnarounds, are um, uh, upwards of uh, uh, double digits to 20% of all the maintenance spending is uh, related to uh, CUI um, issues. So uh, those, those are some of the biggest things. Excellent. Thank you, Jack. Uh, the next one is for you, David, and that is, what if the owner is not currently engaging the contractor, manufacturer, and or fabricator, fabricator distributor in their process? How can we introduce or promote the philosophy of a total team planning? That question is a hard one to answer sometimes because if a, if an owner is not used to having that up front in the planning, it may be hard to convince them. But based on what we've just talked about today, many of these items will help save money for the customer, make his turnarounds 
go more efficient, which means they're faster, which may give him some days back on the end to put his process back in in service, making him more money. Uh, many of these processes have, uh, I guess, retail values, revenue that are in the millions for two days of running. So you give a guy back a day or two because of your suggestions, they're going to listen to it. They're going to listen to it because it has money. Uh, getting that audience with them, uh, you know, most contractors know when turnarounds are going to come up, it's time to start talking to them. It's time to start maybe take your uh, distributor or your manufacturer of materials in with you and both of you talk to the guy. I think uh, they, they listen when you start cutting time off a of turnaround. Great. Thanks, David. Um, Jack, the next one's for you, and that is how do you plan your inventory levels, and um, do they remain static over year over year? Um, well, they don't remain static. As I mentioned um, on that one slide that showed the uh, the roller coaster looking thing, um, our inventories are planned. Um, we do a plan at the beginning of the year, um, and then we adjust it as uh, a monthly, um, even more after, actually, it's every two weeks um, throughout the year and uh, adjust the plan. But it's based on history and it's also based on the most recent sales forecast. That's, that's where we adjust it um, every couple of weeks. And um, it's not static, so it's not you know some level, the same level every month of every year. Um, it goes up and down based upon our busy seasons, which uh, what we call our busy season is your, is your turnaround season. And um, it's uh, the spring and the fall are the big ones, with the fall being the higher, uh, uh, the, the busier season for us, and that's uh, pretty much based on uh, based on I don't know 40 years of history. Um, spring and fall, with fall being the biggest. So it's a uh, it's a moving target, and um, we we keep moving it, trying to uh, make sure we have the right material when we need it, which is pretty much when you need it. Excellent. Uh, the next one is also for you, Jack. And that is, how does thermal insulation coating compare to traditional insulation? They're considering replacing traditional insulation with TIC due to CUI issues. So the TIC is coating? Mm -hmm. I'm not, I, I, I'm familiar a little bit with coatings because um, they're being used more and more. So um, I'm not fully familiar with TIC, so I'm having a hard time, um, I'll have a hard time addressing that, but I know there are a lot of coatings specified these days um, for pipes, and it's all related to the CUI issue. And um, I, so I don't know how TIC performs as opposed to like a TSA, a thermal spray aluminum, versus some of the other ones. But uh, coatings under on the pipe under the insulation to break the uh, um, you know the, the the connection between water and um, uh, the insulations in the pipe are very common these days, and um, I think they're something that's um, going to here to stay. Uh, but I can't yeah. comment. On TAC. I just don't know. David, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, please. Uh, there's a there's several coatings for insulation out there. The temperature range is limited on the hot side and the cold side for the coating. Uh, it may be something that's really good to fight CUI where there's in the CUI range, um, you know, 140 degrees to kind of keep it there, but 200 degrees maybe where that's a CUI problem. Uh, there are some coatings that will handle that and bring it down to a good touch temperature. Uh, but where it gets high coated for insulation, there's certainly coatings that can take high temperatures, but they're not an insulation coating. So. Uh, the insulated coatings have a temperature range that won't reach to a, where uh, typical insulation does. Oh, okay. So that maybe this is related to insulation used as coating, or coatings used as insulation. This one says yes. they're specifically considering replacing traditional insulation with a TIC with TIC due to CUI issues. Oh, okay. All right. And these I, I think are coatings that. Um, yeah, I think it's a, it's more of an emissivity play as far as the insulation value. Um, right. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I misinterpreted the question. Um, uh, yeah, I don't think they're, they're like like you said, David. You answered it more uh, um, more correctly because they are for the lower temperatures, 
And um, there's still a lot of heat loss on those um, because it's all based on color and emissivity. But um, uh, so there's, uh, but they do bring the surface temperature down, and they uh, they do um, you know provide a coating to the pipe, which is uh, beneficial for CUI. Um, but there is heat loss, and um, uh, you, you can run the calculations on what you're looking at with heat loss with those. Excellent. And we do, we do actually offer a technical bulletin online, and we will follow up with the person who asked this question privately and send that technical bulletin. Um, Jack, we had a number of questions come through about the water-resistant calcium silicate. Can you just elaborate a little bit more on what the product is, how it came about, so on and so forth? Yes. This is a, uh, an enhancement we made a year ago. Um, we introduced it to the market last summer to our uh, calcium silicate product. It's uh, our Thermo 12 uh, Gold became Thermo 1200 when we introduced it. And it was mainly a, um, a contractor um, play that ended up being a product that was um, the, the engineers liked um, as well as uh, were better than I actually thought they would. And the whole idea was not to make it hydrophobic, <clears throat> but to make it water resistant, to be able to take a rainstorm or two um, during the day when the insulators are installing it. Because insulators, and David, you can elaborate on this too if you want to, but I, in my experience, our experience, is insulators can install insulation faster than the uh, metal guys can, can install the jacketing material, the weatherproofing. And as the day goes on, the insulators get farther and farther ahead, ahead and um, the afternoon rainstorm comes, and um, traditional calcium silicate would uh, readily absorb the water from the rain. And the, um, the AFTM spec for calcium silicate calls for it to be replaced if it absorbs more than 20% by weight of its water. And the traditional calcium silicate um, readily absorbed um, that um, and more. This product um, that we have now, which is a uh, water-resistant calcium silicate, um, is designed to absorb less than 15% in a 20-minute uh, uh, a um, uh, rainstorm, um, that uh, typical rainstorm you'd see on the Gulf Coast in, a, in the afternoon. So that's, that's its benefit, so you don't have to scramble off the scaffold um, to get the rolls of visqueen and climb back up to the pipe rack to cover it all up. Um, for that 10-15-minute uh, July-August rainstorm that comes every single afternoon. Um, it's a productivity thing for the, uh, the, the insulators more than anything else. But, it, but it's water resistant, water resistant, not hydrophobic like a perlite or a uh, insulin uh, blanket. So there was one more question um, just about water resistant insulation and how much more expensive it is than, um, I guess, non-water resistant insulation. Maybe you could speak to that. It, um, it's um idea. <laughs> yeah, it's um it's it's not more expensive is my answer. Um, okay. It's the same the price didn't go up when we introduced it. All right. The next question is what consideration should we take in insulating material insulating with materials to help with CUI? This is for me, mm -hmm. not David. David, you want to answer that one? I'm getting all the questions, man. Uh, um, <clears throat> you're doing a good so, job. Yeah. So could you repeat this? Sure, one David, of those one more time. Is, could you repeat this question for David? Um, yeah. CUI is a big concern. Um, what consideration should we take in insulating with materials to help with CUI? And uh, I'm just – well, go, go ahead, ahead, David. I was just kidding. If you want to take a shot. I'll take a shot. So okay. uh, insulation in, in, in my contractor's point of view and probably an owner should be part of a system of our envelope to combat CUI. Um, Saying that insulation can do it all by itself is is probably something you don't want to do. You want a good coating underneath where it's, the temperatures are in that range. You want a good coating on your piping or equipment. So that, number one, that helps you right off the bat. We talked about TSA. That's one that's been popular in the last few years. Uh, but certainly uh, an insulation that is some kind of water repellency or is hydrophobic can help you uh, it, it mitigates that possibility. I'm not going to say well, you can totally stop water entrance into a piping system or insulation system because it's going to get damaged somehow, somewhere mechanically by someone in the plant. You saw the picture earlier where they walked all over that uh, fibrous material and, and damaged everything. Well, that's just sucking water up. Once it gets water in it, it's no longer 
viable as an insulation. It, it just kills it. It's like grounding out. So I think your best bet is a good system from surface to through insulation. So that means a good coating and a good insulation, that being a hydrophobic type insulation or one that is water resistant that you can put in or one that has uh, some inhibitors in it to neutralize bad water when it comes through or is left stagnant there after it dries out. Uh, go ahead, Jack. Yeah, just to, to add on to what you said, David, you're exactly right. A properly designed and installed system is um, the key in the beginning, and um, then you got to maintain it, and that's the, uh, the, the second key. And a lot of times where, uh, as time goes on, where everything falls apart, um, it's very difficult to maintain the miles and miles of pipe uh, insulation, uh, the, the systems that you see in, the, in a refinery or chemical plant these days. Um, so then you get to, well, what materials do I select, um, if that's the case? And there are water-resistant materials, there are hydrophobic materials, there's coatings for pipes, there's all kinds of options. Um, and there are also corro insulation materials available now with corrosion inhibitors um, in them, um, in the formulation. And um, hydrophobic helps, but it's not the, the end-all solution. Um, there's, uh, you can do a belts and suspenders approach with, um, you know, hydrophobic combined with the uh, corrosion inhibitors. Um, there's all kinds of different things you can look at now. Um, and there's uh, there's a lot of um, test data to back up some some different options, uh, testing to uh, new corrosion standards like the ASTM C1617, and um, NACE has a, uh, a a newer test. It's probably the, the newest test that's around now. It's the uh, uh, TG516, which um, a lot of the, uh, the the insulation companies and coating companies are uh, beginning to test materials too, which which actually um, is an attempt to test very long range um, uh, materials and coatings over a long period of time with uh, severe cycling um, over a six month period, uh, daily cycling of a of a wet dry wet dry with uh, you know high 1500 parts per million chlorides in in the water. So. Um, we're getting a lot more, you know, data these days than we ever had, and um, we're finding, we're learning a lot more about the systems and the insulations and the coatings you can select um, for uh, corrosion performance, CUI performance, than we've ever known in the past. So there's, uh, there's, it's, it's a huge CUI is a huge topic and a huge, um, I don't know industry almost these days. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a big deal and uh, we're all part of it. Great. Um, this next question I'm actually going to take a stab at and that is how could I have a selection chart for insulation material or if there's new insulation material produced by your company, how can I find out? And actually, if you go to the source, which is a, um, a, the, the portal I mentioned earlier, on that portal we have in our tools section, we have um, what we call a part and it's a product application rating tool. And basically what we've done is we've assigned um, numeric values in terms of product performance to, to our insulation. So let's say you're looking for something with compressive strength. Well, calcium silicate is going to get a high score and mineral wool is going to get a lower score because they're different kinds of insulation. They have different, much significantly different um, levels of compressive strength. So as you're going through and you say, well, I have an application and I need a lightweight material that is hydrophobic um, and can go to 1,200 degrees. All right. Well. If you flag each of those and you, you put, you know, these are, the, these are the, um, the specific characteristics that are the most important to me and you offer a numeric value to those, what, what the part actually does is it gives you an output of the materials that are going to be best suited for your application. So this is a, a great tool and an online resource that you'll have access to if you just go to the source and um, it will actually let you select the material based off of your, um, your application criteria. And then we always have, um, if you're looking for the insulation materials offered by Johns Vanville, we always have our product selection guides. Those are available online and certainly you can find anything through our website. So the next one, Jack, is coming back to you and that is, can you get calcium silicate as water resistant and non-water resistant? Not, uh, not today. Um, we, Johns Vanville is the only manufacturer of calcium silicate in North America today and uh, we have two factories. 
but uh, today, we, as of the, a year ago, we only manufacture water-resistant calcium silicate. We no longer manufacture the old style. All right. Um, David, I'm going to let you take this next one, and that is what is an EPC, and specifically, what, is an e what does EPC stand for? Engineering Procurement and Construction Company. So that would be similar to uh, CBNI, uh, Fleur Daniel, Fleur Technique, any of the large EPC companies, they, they do it all for the owner. So a lot of grassroots projects are done through EPCs. The owner knows what he wants, gets them in there to design it, procure everybody that does the work, and do the construction at some time. So do some part of that construction or all of that construction. So that's what it stands for. Excellent. Thank you. Um, the next one is also for you, and that is, what is temporary insulation, and what kind of insulation is best for temporary insulation? So that's something you have to look at, at what your processes are, what unit you're in uh, during the turnaround, what kind of abuse it may take during the turnaround. But uh, a lot of times the owner will want to use some duct wrap, which is a foil-backed uh, fiber maybe two inch, inch and a half that you can temporarily wrap with. But one of the things you should bring up to the owner is if he's changing or would be willing to change maybe from what he has to a flexible blanket type insulation, a microfiber type insulation that is very efficient by the per inch is more efficient than others. So you could actually put that on as a hydrophobic type insulation as a temporary insulation and then take it off during the turnaround, mark it, put it back as the insulation, the permanent insulation. I've seen customers be able to do that on a six inch, say a six inch line and you're doing uh, the middle 12 feet because they put in a two T's. Uh, they had no problem with if there was, you know, two inches of a uh, a rigid insulation already on there and you only needed to put on a half inch of this uh, very good blanket insulation that's also hydrophobic, they had no problem, you know, swedging down with the metal to that section of the line to do that just so that it saved time. It doesn't, aesthetically it looks different when you're looking down the line, but it's, it's insulated just as well, if not better, with the new material. Excellent. Thank you, David. Um, so I would just, we're about to wrap up here. I would like to draw your attention. Um, everybody should have received a link to the technical bulletin on coatings versus insulation, as well as to the part tool. Um, and all those are, again, available on our website if you don't want to go through the links. Um, but that concludes our, our webinar for today. As I mentioned, you are going to receive a survey immediately following the webinar. So if you have any additional questions, comments, concerns, this is a great opportunity for you to submit those. Maybe you didn't get to ask them today or you, um, or you're, you're, you think of them after we close out here. Um, but also, we'd love to hear your thoughts on how we did and um, get more information from you on, on how you think we can improve. So with that, you will be getting your um, certificate of completion. Again, that's going to come to you by Friday and we will send you an email when this webinar has been posted online. So thank you very much for your time today. We appreciate it and hope you found this webinar very valuable and helpful, and uh, we will see you guys next time. Bye-bye.